Good afternoon, everyone. Good a <laughs> I'm, I'm told that we, um, we expect a full house, but um, since we have the courtesy of our speakers all being here and panelists, and since it's such a provocative topic, um, I think we should start and, and then welcome people as they, as they join us. My name is Donna Carroll. For any of you I don't know, I'm um, actually, I can say this as part of this introduction. I'm in my 23rd year as president. Now, <laughs> now that, that is significant. It's always significant to me, but that's significant in, in this moment for, for two reasons. Dominican is about to celebrate the, its 20th anniversary as a university, having changed our name from Rosary College to Dominican University in May of 1997. And more pertinent to, um, to this gathering, tonight we're celebrating um, the 15th anniversary of the, uh, of the original founding of the Follett Chip which is very exciting. At, at that time, and I, and I would argue still in, in a small elite group, ours was the only the fourth chair in the discipline of library and information sciences that had been established by, by the, the Follett Corporation. So, so Follett took a risk on Dominican and the discipline um, at a time when um, we were both looking to make a, st a strong and enduring statement about the continuing importance and transformative role in, of libraries in, in our society um, and in our world. So 15 years later, um, we are here with a partnership that endures and is stronger than ever. Um, we're celebrating a program that endures and has had some transforming um, moments of late, moving from um, the Graduate School of Library and Information Science to the School of Information Studies, and just recently being admitted into that lofty, exclusive realm of iSchools. <laughs> so we... Um, it's a, it's a good time for Dominican. It's a good time for this discipline. It's a challenging time for us all, um, both in the context of higher education and the context of our, um, our country and the context of our, our state. So um, I'm delighted you're all here um, to celebrate what's been accomplished. I stand up here each year, first and foremost, to, to thank the Fala Corporation for um, the enormous um, investment they made in this chair. And um, the, tonight is, is one of those moments when we demonstrate our ROI, our return on investment. You're here. We have an extraordinary Follett chair. He has gathered an extraordinary panel to have a very provocative conversation that, um, that demonstrates the impact of libraries in this very challenging and unusual time. So without further ado, I will invite our dean to introduce the Follett chair, and we'll get going. Okay. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Britton Follett. I am officially the vice president of Follett, uh, Follett School Solutions, the K-12 division of Follett. Um, how many of you are familiar with Follett? Oh, well, it's a friendly audience. <laughs> 
Um, so we talked about the creation of the Follett Chair in 2002. 15 years, I suppose, flies. But I want to take you back. 2002, I was graduating college and decided to pursue a job in television news. Um, my dad said, you need to be a broadcast journalist. And I said, okay, that sounds like a cool job. And so I spent 10 years in television as a reporter, an anchor, and uh, a truth teller. I loved the job. It was the perfect career for a curious lady who always asked good questions and wanted to meet new people and uncover the origins of a story and get to the bottom of uh, corruption and hold people in power accountable. And as the career evolved, I started asking people, how many of you watch the news at night? And I saw fewer and fewer and fewer people say that they watched it. And I said, okay, I'm 30. I probably need to consider whether this is something I want to do for the rest of my life. So I found myself facing the reality that the career I had chosen needed to transform. More and more people were seeking news on the internet and fewer and fewer of them were tuning in at 10 o'clock. And I saw the medium needing to change, needing to evolve. And I made the decision to start applying for jobs outside of television news. And at that time, it just so happened, um, I said, well, if I'm going to apply for jobs outside of television news, I probably should at least consider the family business. <laughs> and it's not because I didn't get along delightfully with my family and everyone else, but I said I wanted to chart my own course. But um, there happened to be a marketing manager position on our international division. And so over the course of the last six years since I took a job at Follett, um, I have really embraced not just marketing, but really advocating for the roles of school librarians. Um, back to my dad, he said when I was young I should grow up to be a librarian, and I thought that that was a little boring. While I love to read, I, I thought, well, um, I don't know that that's what I should be doing. However, it turns out I think it was the perfect role for me because now, as a television reporter, I have an opportunity to tell the stories of successful school libraries around the world. and. Librarianship, just like television, just like the discussion we're going to have tonight, is at a fulcrum point. Um, I had a librarian in Texas come up to me. I always say, what can Follett do better for you? And this librarian said, you need to be our voice. And that's a really difficult challenge, but one that we've taken on at Follett. Rather than spending our dollars on marketing to school librarians, we're investing in initiatives like Future Ready Libraries and really investing in professional development for librarians and the industry as a whole because I believe that the topic of fake news, the topic of digital citizenship, librarians can be a perfect leader and a perfect solution for the challenges that principals and superintendents are facing in school districts across the country. But there's still a lot of principals and superintendents who don't understand the role of the librarian. And there's librarians who say, I don't know how to start that conversation. And so tonight, I'm really excited to hear the panelists talk and hear David's presentation so I can take these ideas back to the schools that I have an opportunity to visit and say, hey, the topic of fake news is all through our Facebook feeds. I say, poor Willie Nelson has died seven times in my Facebook feed, and the guy's still alive. We have to teach these students how to vet materials and in a world where we're being inundated with resources, librarians have an opportunity to step up and curate, to be that partner for teachers, to solve the problem principals are facing with digital citizenship. And so we're at a fulcrum point, and I think there's not one librarian out there who can't have a conversation with their principal and say, hey, I can lead the charge in educating students on how to vet resources and how to get to the bottom of fake news. So without further ado, our fall at chair. There's no pressure like the um, corporation who's named your position <laughs> expecting you to know what you're talking about. Um, the social responsibility of the library and librarian in a post-factual world is a title that we came up with several months ago. And as always, the issue when you're organizing sessions is you want to find a title that is interesting and useful and hopefully doesn't time out. So we are only slightly disappointed 
that now that we have a presidential administration that's clearly gotten it straight on how we communicate information, and this is no longer an issue, you'll bear with us. Um, I'm going to begin with a, a little discussion of fake news and then go into a role and some approaches that I don't think are going to work and explain why. Um, I'm going to begin with the idea that the library response to the notion of fake news and the challenge of authenticity and the changing of the discussions. I've seen three major responses. By the way, I have to take a moment just because I think that is one of the best National Enquirer headlines ever. World's saddest book causes dozens of suicides. <laughs> it's like, I, hey, there you go. The first one is information literacy. If only people were more information literate, they wouldn't fall for this stuff. Clearly, what we need to do is more information literacy, information literacy, information literacy, information literacy. The problem with information literacy as approach is that study after study has shown that what information literacy courses do, information literacy sessions do, information literacy programs do, is they increase people's confidence in their ability to, to value information without a corresponding increase in their ability to evaluate sources and information. Information literacy also it makes a couple of assumptions by and large. It makes the assumption that when presented with the truth, with presented with fact, factual information or reified information or information from authentic sources, that it will replace your current belief structure. And yet psychology studies time and time again have shown, in fact, that's the opposite of what happens. People tend to dig in. And if you have a stepfather like I do, it's really true. <laughs> The other problem with information literacy is it assumes that there is a set of data and a concrete foundation that we can drive people to. That there is a positive, good way at looking at these resources that we can evaluate them. There are things like we can put out ways of assessing resources. Turns out those same mechanisms we use to assess resources are perfectly tuned to help people fake the resources so they look authentic. But my big one, uh, big idea, and I apologize this is a sort of grand scheme, but it comes from a book uh, by the Sapiens, written by Harari, who's an um, Israeli medieval historian who wrote a fabulous book, if you had the chance. And he talks about the scientific revolution. And he, many people in the scientific revolution think about it as, oh, we began to get facts and evidence and knowledge. But what he points out, and I'm sorry it's a long quote, so let me read it. When modern culture admitted that there were many important things that it still did not know, and when that admission of ignorance was married to the idea that scientific discoveries could give us new powers, people began suspecting that real progress might be possible after all. As science began to solve one unsolvable problem after another, many became convinced that humankind could overcome any and every problem by acquiring and applying new knowledge. Poverty, sickness, wars, famines, old age, and death itself, and I love this line, were not the inevitable fate of humankind, they were simply the fruits of our ignorance. What's interesting is when we look at information literacy, one approach is that what we want to do is give people the facts and the truth. We want to build their knowledge. And what I love about this quote is oftentimes the first step to building knowledge is admitting your ignorance. That, in fact, that was the, what the scientific revolution it said. It didn't come from the great book. It didn't come from the wise man. It didn't come from this source. Not everything was known. We have to first admit what we don't before we can explore it. And so, in fact, much of information literacy must be turning people skeptical. We, in other words, we know, for example, within 50 milliseconds, when someone looks at a website, they have already made a value determination on whether it's a good website or not, purely by its aesthetic content. And so that means that after one second, you're working against a 50 millisecond perception. That's hard to do, to tell people, stop, take some time, analyze this. Because they're not going to do it for a majority of what they've done. And they're certainly going to put lots of things in the way where they don't need to. We do that on a regular basis. We have the expert tell us, our friend tell us, the professional tell us. We hire the lawyer to handle the law. We hire a doctor to handle the medicine. And so asking people to be skeptical about a wider range of resources is one really interesting and also, by the way, as I'm sure Britton will point out from marketing, doesn't make a great tagline. We make skeptics out of your children. Right? <laughs> Just a thought. So I would argue that the, the response to this is not an information literacy problem. It's part of the solution, but it's not in and of itself. 
The other is we'll talk about the promotion of quality, that in fact what the library will do is go back to only capturing, distributing, and pointing to quality. This invariably turns into yet another lib guide about a topic with 3,000 resources that are all the dead the next three days, and then there's another resource, and etc. The other problem with this notion of quality is that it changes. So I am, just to make for my academic friends in the audience really clear, I'm a social constructivist. I believe that a lot of how we come to our knowledge and what we believe is comes through a social context. Um, I come by that naturally because I'm a scientist. And science, many people think of science as a, the quest for truth, and it is. But it is founded on a key concept that you can never find it. It's founded on something called falsifiability. That is, when you come up with a theory, when you come up with a piece of evidence, when you come up with a hypothesis, it's only as good as it's matched to the data in the real world. The minute you find one little thing that doesn't fit, the theory's gone. That's why evolution, that's why things like relativity have stood the track past of time, because for hundreds of years, people have been trying to poke those holes. And they've been able to withstand that. But that's very different. Saying things like the theory of evolution is not the same thing as a biologist saying it is, that's how it works. It's to say that is our best understanding and match to the evidence. It's a different thing. And oftentimes, as we know, many people on other sides of that discussion will use that as a weakness of the approach. So quality, this is one of my favorite. 1950, I believe 1953 was when it first came out. 1958. The Coming Ice Age, a true scientific detective story telling about how two scientists had finally figured out what was happening. Global cooling was coming. And these weren't like, you know, some scientist hanging out with Marianne and the skipper on an island. I mean, you know, these were institutional people. We know things change. We know this constant quest for the truth has barriers and has limitations, but ultimately it's what we're doing. And as I've often, as a Star Trek, or Star Wars, <laughs> geek, I am a Star Trek geek as well, but I know the difference. As a, as a Star Wars geek, I always say, you know, there's no greater, you know, den of filth and villainy than a good academic library. I mean, it's, it's full of all the bad stuff because you need to know its history. You need to know alternative views. You need to explore things, understand where it worked and where it didn't. Scott can correct me if I got that wrong. But what I want to spend time on is more this idea of the neutral resource and talk about the social aspect. And that is, when confronted with fake news, when confronted with these alternative facts and such, the general feeling that as librarians, it's our job not to be involved, that we're neutral, that we're objective, that we shouldn't take a stand. And what I'm going to argue is that's not true. Now, many people might think, given fake news and context, that I would begin that conversation with this, which is talking about voting and politics and the, and the race, because there's just nothing more fun than yet another discussion of the 2016 presidential race. But I am, in fact, going to start it in a different spot. An equally happy point, I'm going to add, talk to you about cancer. Because the other reason I'm a social constructivist as opposed to being a scientist is I'm also a cancer survivor. So just to be clear, consider this a trigger warning, I am about to play the cancer card really hard. So at the end, you will have sympathy. This is a lymph node. I'm sure you were wondering. A lymph node is a structure throughout the body, part of the lymphatic system, which works in conjunction with your circulatory system to do things like drain fluids from your arms and legs. And also, it is a primary means of your immune system, where different lymphocytes and white blood cells hang out to kill infections and to trap infections. The thing is that every so often, a lymph node is also a very interesting structure within your body. As a human being, you have between 500 and 700 distributed throughout your body, primarily up here in your shoulders and in your gut. And there's something interesting about lymph nodes, which is when you get sick, your immune system kicks in, your lymph nodes get flooded with these white blood cells that are there to kill it. That's why when you have a sore throat, your doctor, or in my case, my mother, always did this for a half an hour before she decided whether I could go to school or not because your glands are infected, you can't go. Well, that's what's going on. 
It also turns out that if you have a tumor, say breast cancer, or you have a tumor in colon cancer, that when it begins to metastasize, that is, when it begins to spread, it does so by releasing cancerous cells into the bloodstream. They get captured in the lymph system, and that's why if you've ever, unfortunately, had to deal with those situations, you'll know that oftentimes they biopsy a lymph node, what's normally called a sentinel lymph node, to find out if it's spreading. But there's another type of cancer, which are blood cancers, leukemia or lymphoma, in which case actually what happens is the immune system itself mutates. And so white blood cells that are there to wipe out infections mutate into cancerous cells where they get circulated throughout your body. And it shows up in this. And if it's a very specific type of mutation, a certain B-type cell will turn into what's called a Reed-Sternberg cell. And if you ever see a Reed-Sternberg cell in a lymph node, it means that you have Hodgkin's lymphoma, which I did. Hodgkin's lymphoma is a situation where that cell and the immune system will begin to attack itself. It will begin to replicate and store uncontrollably to the point where those lymphs begin to collect more and more debris, more and more toxins, more and more cancerous cells, and grow. They will grow to the point, if unaffected, where they will stop your heart from beating because your lymph nodes will grow so big it will choke them out. Or they'll collapse your lungs so that you can't breathe, and all that's assuming that your spleen, which is in essence a huge lymph node, doesn't explode along the way, spreading toxins and sepsis throughout your abdomen. This is a fun conversation, I know. <laughs> the reason I bring that up is because what's very interesting is we can cure it. Not 100%, but Hodgkin's lymphoma is one of the few cancers where we talk about cures, either through chemotherapy, it used to be radiation, but in chemotherapy, or in the extreme, in my case, through a bone marrow or stem cell transplant where they literally replace your immune system. I'm three years old. It's lovely. <laughs> I get two gifts a year. It's great. The way you determine and the way they track you after you go through a stem cell transplant to find out if they got it is through something called a PET scan. And a PET scan is in essence where you drink, actually they inject into your veins, a form of radioactive sugar. And cancer cells are known because they replicate really quickly. That's what makes them cancer cells. And so what happens is if lymph nodes take up that sugar because the cancer cells are eating all the sugar, they'll light up on the scan. In this case, there'll be those dark points. By the way, your kidneys will get dark because it's busy filtering it, and your brain's really hungry, so it gets dark as well. So what you see here on your left are, is someone with Hodgkin's lymphoma lighting up with their lymph nodes, and what you're seeing there on your right is what you want to see, which is a nice clean scan. A couple of interesting things to point out about this, and what does this have to do with how we determine information. I'm alive today because of chemotherapy. I'm alive today because I was treated with a series of toxins. What's very interesting, I talk about this, and the reason I'm going into cancer is because this is a scientific area. This is about knowledge and knowing and science and the truth and how we report it. But what you begin to do is you begin to find out the reason I'm alive today because of chemotherapy is because the US government during World War II took minority populations, including Hispanics, Asian Americans, and African Americans, and exposed them to mustard gas to see what their reaction was. It turns out, if it doesn't kill you, what it does, mustard gas begins to affect the way that certain cells divide in their DNA. And it was from those discoveries that they eventually began to refine mustard gas and come out with an alkaline agent that eventually became very effective in chemotherapy. I am alive today because our government gassed minorities during World War II. You begin to discover, for example, I am alive today because people with cancer were willing to volunteer in clinical trials so that people could find out what was the most effective way to fight cancer. It turns out, by the way, that if you are a white male, you are well represented in clinical trials. If you are an African American, or if you are a woman, or if you are any minority, you tend not to be represented in clinical trials or medical trials. I am alive today because I am the right color. What's interesting about this is as we move forward, we've also seen how society has changed. I get to stand up here and talk to you about cancer. Now, very interesting thing. The first thing is when I talk about cancer, I get your sympathy. The other thing you can do when you have cancers, if I have any fellow survivors, you will appreciate this. I can tell cancer jokes, and you can't. 
How many cancer patients does it take to change a light bulb? Six. One to change the light bulb and five to form a support group because they were so brave. <laughs> it's all right. You can laugh at these. I'm allowed. What do you call someone who gets lymphoma over and over again? A lymphomaniac? Just, all right. But this is different because in the early 1900s and the 1800s, had I had cancer, I would have been hidden away and it would have been shameful. It would have been some misrepresentation of what happened to me. Women having breast cancer in the 1800s were considered a result of poor living and not living up to their feminine identity. I am alive today because people like the Susan Coleman Foundation made cancer a quest. They changed how society viewed cancer. But that came at a cost. It turns out if, you have, if you're in the philanthropy business and you're raising funds for breast cancer, good day. If you're raising funds for lung cancer, because it's their fault. Now it's not. Many people get lung cancer. It has nothing to do with smoking. But the general perception in society is lung cancer comes from a risky behavior that we know about. And that changes the amount of money, which changes the amount of funding. I'm alive today because I got a good cancer. Now what's even interesting is that this is all assumes that I could get the chemotherapy to begin with. And that brings in the inevitable fake news and such, which is ironic because this is not fake in any way, when we begin to talk about I was alive today because I had health care. I was alive today because the NIH was well funded. I was alive today because funding went into science. I'm alive today because I came under previous administrations. My point of all of this and where I got to know this is because this is me today. And what you may not notice is there's a little white speck. That is a partially calcified lymph node that still lights up after three years. And I have an oncologist who comes up to me regularly and goes, I said, is it still there? I said, what are we going to do about it? He said, well, we could give you radiation, but then you'll probably get a secondary cancer. He says, we'll do surgery. We'll take you. And I went to see a surgeon. He goes, Pardon me. So I want to be really clear about this. It's right about there. Um, I went to the surgeon. And the surgeon says, you realize that a lymph node is about that big. And it's right in the mesentery region, which is his fancy way of saying it's right in here. <laughs> and he says, if I did this surgery on a 90-year-old or 98-pound teenage girl, maybe I could find it. But there's an excellent chance when I'm looking, I'm going to nick something up, and you're going to want it. <laughs> so ultimately the doctor looked at me and said what do you want to do about that and that's really interesting so you want to talk about fake news what just happened was that a doctor that I went to to give me the truth to give me an assurance sent me down a stream where I now realize that that spot my decision of what I do with it is based on my race, it's based on my ethics, it's based on economics, it's based on social norms and public policy, religion, politics, education. If I proceed forward, I am part of a social discussion about what we should do with cancer. Turns out, by the way, that Hodgkin's lymphoma has what's called a bimodal distribution. People in their 20s get it, and people in their 60s get it. I was weird because I was right in the middle. But it's a discussion if they're in their 20s, of course we're going to treat them. How much life do they have ahead of them? When you're in your 60s, what's the investment that goes into that? I'm alive today because I'm middle age. This idea that every topic, that something as clear cut, something appropriate, something as precise, as knowledgeable and precise and true as science and medicine is in fact a complex interweaving of different perspectives and views is what complicates our concept because it's not just my cancer, it's also things like climate change. It's also things like what is the future of higher education? New York State just said they're going to give free college education at any state or city university. Dot, dot, dot. If it's tuition, if you earn under $125,000 by year three, and you're willing to stay in New York State for every year that you got funding. Right? OK, is that good economics? I came from Syracuse University, a private university in New York. I'm guessing they're not as happy with that discussion. 
It comes with race. It comes with the idea, for example, of, well, what do we do with setting up people who don't come from those perspectives? It comes with public policy. What's the role of higher education in voting? What is voter suppression? What is voter? All of these things come with a massive construction of its importance and its truth and its view. And what I want to begin our conversation tonight and introduce the really important people here is to begin to talk about what are the role of librarians in that construction of our understanding. This is a literary novel. This is Jane Eyre. If you get a chance, read Wayne Wiggin's book on the history of the public library in America. It is a brilliant book. In it, he talks about in the 1850s the scandals, the scandals of public libraries stocking fiction. And the worst of all was the literary novel that only, I, I, I wish I had the quote here, but paraphrasing, only appealed to women of the night and men at bars and led young women and farm boys astray that they thought beyond their station. Today, if you say, oh, our public library doesn't cover that carry that smut like Jane Eyre and Dickens, right? But why did that happen? It wasn't that the literary novel changed. It was one that libraries and the librarians that staffed them changed, and they proactively went out to change the discourse and the social contract and construct around that concept. That librarians engaged and said, no, literature and Fiction have a place, they have a role, and frankly, maybe it's okay if the farm boy thinks that he can be a cowboy, and maybe it's really okay if the farm girl thinks that she doesn't have to be stuck at home. And maybe it's okay if we can dream bigger dreams than what's available in these texts. The public library of this country, many people don't know, comes out of the same social movement that came out of public schooling. Melville Dewey once called the public library the co-equal educational institution to the public school. It came out of the suffragette movement before it. It came around a social change mission. When we look at what happens in school libraries, when we look at what we happen in academic libraries, the concept that libraries have ever been neutral, objective, or not shaping the societal truths is historically inaccurate. And so one of the things we have to talk about, and this is the conversation I want to turn all over, is what is our role today? Misinformation, fake news, propaganda, politicians lying, not so new, right? There are new aspects of it. There are new concepts. But the fact that it is forefront in the dialogue is an opportunity for us as a profession, for us as library schools, for us as a field to step up and say we have a role. Britton and I were just talking briefly before about school librarians being able to go to their principal going, every day your students hear this. Every day the sources that traditionally they relied on to tell them the truth are saying, your president is lying, your, your, your senator is lying, the news is biased. What are you going to do about it? We have a place in the school that can have a constructive conversation. Where are we? I want to give you one example, and then I'll turn it over. The Richland Public Library in Columbia, South Carolina, has a strategic plan. Everyone has strategic plans. They all look remarkably like libraries are good. Readings, yay. We serve the people. What I love about this strategic plan, and I'll go to it in a moment, is that the librarians... Melanie Huggins as the director and her librarians and staff went throughout the Richland County community, which includes Columbia as the state capital, but also includes rural and very rural South Carolinians. They met with mayors, they met with social groups, they met with neighborhood representatives, and they said, what is the strategic direction of this county, and where does the library fit out? So they have as three, uh, four of their goals in their strategic plan. One, to help create a strong and resilient economy. Number two, to strengthen community cohesion. Number three, to transform educational outcomes for our youth. And number four, to help break the cycle of poverty. What Richland did is they took a stand and said the value of having a library here is not simply having resources and a material and a room over there and an escape and quiet. We make the world a better place. And as a community, we gather the community for a conversation. And our community is telling us that poverty is a problem, that our economy is not 
equitable, that our children are not working well in this environment, and the library cannot stand by and be that quiet oasis if the community they serve is not doing well. The article, which I know you can't read to the side, is from the state, which is the Columbia newspaper. Evolution of Richland Library means fewer books but broader resources. The first comment on the website was a quote that Melanie Huggins, the director, had given in the article. Libraries are for people. Now you're thinking, libraries are for people. Really? This is a problem? Well, apparently it was, because the first comment was, no, Melanie, libraries are for to which the second comment was me going, and the books are for dot, dot, dot. But <laughs> this idea of what is the role that we play in it. Are we arbiters of truth? Are we objective and neutral? Or is there a different role that we can play? Are we not about telling a community what the right answer is and the truth? There's a very fine line between being right and being righteous, after all. Or are we about helping a community weave together its fabric to understand what are our common understandings, where are our areas of disagreement, and what are our rules of engagement for civic conversation? And to help us have that conversation, I've been joined by a fabulous panel. Um, Nicole Cook is an assistant professor and program director at the University of Illinois, program director for the Library Science Program at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Miguel Figueroa, see, I asked him how to pronounce it, so now in my head I just sit there and go, all right, I got it, thank you, is uh, with the Center for the Future at the American Library Association. And Scott Walter is the university librarian at DePaul University. Um, I've asked them because they've all played very important roles in looking at how libraries are dealing with this. 